As you heard, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, and I spend a lot of my time talking about science to the public. And when we talk about science, we're very good at talking about facts, about understanding, about knowledge, explaining how it all works and satisfying curiosity. But as far as I'm concerned, if that's all we do, we're hiding half of the bounty available. Because what I am privileged to have as a scientist, I think, is a perspective, a different perspective on our world. And so what I would like to do this evening is to take you on a tour, if you like, a flight of fantasy around a little bit of the perspective that you might have if you think about science some of the time. I think everyday science is completely undervalued. There's loads of very shiny things out there, but actually some of the most everyday things are some of the most mind-blowing. So I'm hoping that this tour through my own perspective might help you appreciate some of the things that you already know a little bit better. And we're going to start at night in the desert in Arizona. Because when you're standing out in a desert like this, you're a speck on the boundary between our planet and the cosmos. The mountains there are like a fence between you and the sky. And above you, half your world is the starry sky with the Milky Way stretching across it. And the floor at your feet, stretching away towards the mountains, is pockmarked with cacti, lit by a dim glow, by light that's been traveling perhaps since the start of human civilization, perhaps since the age of the dinosaurs, and perhaps for longer than that. And imagine standing in this desert, a human on your own, and getting out a torch, but not a normal torch, one that provides ultraviolet light. And that's a wavelength that we can't see. Our species is blind to UV light. But get the torch out and shine it around, and you won't be able to see where it's pointing. And then there'll be a speck, uh, there'll be a, a, a flash of light, something puncturing the darkness. And as you shine the torch back to where it came from, you'll see a surprise scuttling patch of really eerie bright blue. And that's a scorpion. Scorpions, uh, their carapace glows in UV light. Uh, it's an adaptation to help them survive in the desert at dusk, the time when scorpions would like to hide. There's a lot more UV light than visible light around, and the scorpion can detect its own glow. So it knows if, it, if it's glowing, it needs to find a better hiding place. But what it's doing is taking light that we can't see in the UV and converting it into visible light that we can see in blues and greens. And the really nice thing about this is it's a reminder that there's so much more light out there than the stuff that we can see. We only see a tiny fraction of the total. We live our lives submerged in light. And that light is carrying information because all of it carries the signal of where it came from. And yet our bodies block most of it out. Um, but not all of it. We do have eyes. And in this sea of light that surrounds us all, there's one tiny place where it gets in, the pupils of our eyes, which are small circles, just a few millimeters in diameter. And they keep most of the light out. The tiny amount that gets in is all we have to interpret the world. And that boundary between the outside and us is a soft, gelatinous lens. And what it does is it slows down the light. It slows it down to about 60% of its normal speed. And as it slows down, the light swerves. And so light that came from a single point on the outside of our bodies spreads out, hits our eyes, and comes back in to a single point on the back of our eyes. And that is what lets us take information about the world and make sense of it. And when that photon hits the retina, it hits a molecule like this. This is opsin, an opsin. Um, it's a molecule that sits in the back of the eye. And basically what happens is a single photon will twist a single opsin around, and it starts a chain of dominoes in the back of our eye, a chain that leads to the most complicated thing in the known universe, which is the human brain. So this is the brain that we look out at the world with. But even though we're getting all this visual richness from this tiny fraction of the sea that we're looking in, we're still not seeing everything there is. 
This is, uh, this is South Georgia. This is, uh, it's an island in the South Atlantic. It's where the explorer Ernest Shackleton is buried. It's very famous in Antarctic history. But it's a typical mountain scene. That's why it's here. So you've probably looked at these many, many times, images like this. And this looks like a serene place, a passive environment. But that's just because you're not seeing what you're looking at. This is the engine of the planet at work. The dark mountains will be absorbing the sun's heat and heating up so that each dark patch becomes like a little hot plate heating the air above it. And since warmer air rises, the heat above the dark, the air above the dark patches will rise. And then the ice at the top is acting like a mirror, reflecting the sun's light back out into the cosmos. And so the air above the ice is cold, tends to be sinking. And so even as you're looking through this scene across at the mountains, you're looking through rising and falling air, moving around depending on shifts in temperature. And then think about the grass at the bottom. So grass seems to be pretty passive stuff. But if you could get a microscope and zoom in on those blades of grass, what you would see is that the water from the roots is being pulled up tiny tubes, the xylem, inside the plant. Um, the xylem is being, the, the water is being pulled up through the plants. It's, escaping through tiny holes in the underside of the leaves called stomata. So now if we look at the mountains, um, every, that, those mountains are covered in streams and every click of a, pedal, a pebble on those streams represents another bit of this mountainside collapsing to dust. Every single time a rock moves or something bumps into something else, a little bit of dust will fall off. And over eons, those mountains will be carried away by water. So this is this engine. You look at this scene. This is not a passive scene. This is an active scene. Loads and loads of stuff is going on, and yet we don't normally see it. But even in the environments we do make, this is a natural environment. It was here before humans were here. Even in our own cities, we don't see everything there is to see. Let's have a think about the electrical grid. There are copper wires all around us now. And in those copper wires, there are point-like electrons shuffling along. They're shepherding energy from the power stations to the plug socket. Every time you plug in a kettle, you're connecting it via metal and semiconductors to every other plugged-in kettle in the country, to every medical scanner, to every rock star's amplifier, and to every television. And this grid is pushing energy around all the time. It's surrounding us. And the greatest testimony to this web is that nobody ever notices it. The electrons shuffle past us and underneath us and over the top of us silently. And we never see them, and yet they power the modern world. So some of that energy is going to get pushed out via transmitters like this one radio waves or pushed out across the landscape, carrying the imprint of voices. And as they travel, they're going through trees and through humans and through buildings, carrying information. And then Wi-Fi signals full of cats and news and data and social things and gossip and all kinds of other binary bits are being pushed out on shorter wavelengths, on the microwaves. And they tend to bounce off, get absorbed by walls. They travel differently. And so even when you look at a city street, even though you can't see it, right here, there's a hum. There's a hum of radio waves, of Wi-Fi signals, of television signals, of the signals from remote controls, like this one in my hand, maybe some radar, all sorts of things going on. And we are completely blind to all of it, even though we created it, except and unless when we get a small piece of metal, just the right size to be an aerial, and we can pluck one single wavelength from that menu, that hum, and take from it images and voices and other binary bits. And then some of this energy, some of this beamed out, these beamed out electromagnetic waves connect us to this swarm of satellites that is carried along with our planet. And these satellites are looking down on us. We look up at them, we don't see them. They're looking down on us. And they're surrounding us. They're carried with us like pets. And they can see the Earth. Now, have a think about something. If there's a globe that you see, um, so old globes like, uh, like this one, any globe that was made before 1959 was made by someone who had never seen the planet. All they had to go on was deduction, measurements from ships, 
made over centuries. We've known the planet is round for centuries, but until 1959, no one who had seen the planet ever made a globe. And it's this enormous testament to um, human powers of deduction and science and technology that when they actually did make globes in the end, they looked pretty much like the real thing. Um, that's entirely underappreciated, but it's a really lovely thought. So then out beyond the satellites, if you keep going, here's the Earth's magnetic field and it's protecting us from cosmic rays. So if you step out, you go through the magnetic field, you are stepping outside that shield and out there is a different, the world, the universe is a different place. There are cosmic rays battering in on you. There's very little gravity. If you put a pendulum clock outside the magnetic field, somewhere out around the planet, it wouldn't work. There isn't enough gravity to make the pendulum tick. And out here, everything happens on a different scale. Out in the universe, everything is either very, very fast or very, very slow. So, for example, the reactions, the nuclear reactions that power the sun happen incredibly quickly, and yet the sun itself only changes over billions of years. And so lots of tiny atomic transitions can happen on a really, really small scale, but their outcomes are the size of a planet or a moon or a solar system. And so we sit in the middle of this size scale. Nanometers are too small for us. Thousands of kilometers are too big for us. And we sit in the middle of the time scales. Uh, nanoseconds are far too fast for us to pay attention to, but Billions of years are far, far too long for us to pay attention to. We're actually really unusual in the universe in acting on small, in this sort of mid-range of size scales and time scales. We're an exception. And so here we are on our planet. We look out to space and maybe something is looking back. And the light that we get from the universe is our connection to everything that isn't our planet. When light hits the retina at the back of our eyes, that's our link to the rest of the universe. And so here we are, a messy, sentient, beautiful layer stuck in between the planet and the cosmos, a thin coating on a rocky planet. And there's not, that's it, that's us, that's all we are. And so look at this planet here, and somewhere in the dusk around the other side, in this messy, sentient, beautiful layer, imagine a human being with a torch who's really happy because they've just seen a scorpion and it's glowing bright blue. Thank you.